Welcome back 4060 Wonders. If you're watching this, you have managed to find the YouTube videos that will serve as our form of lecture henceforth. It's my intention that in most cases that you try to watch the YouTube video a bit beforehand and then I will be on the Zoom uh, meeting rooms during the lecture period to answer questions about the content of the lecture. It's the case that I want to spend just a couple minutes to talk about logistics before we get underway with the content. Uh, the course homepage on Canvas has been revamped just a little bit. We now have Zoom links in most cases uh, to events that would normally happen. For instance, my office hours are accessible uh, by clicking on the following link around the times uh, that are listed Tuesday, Thursday, 3 to 4. Some of the GTAs have had a chance to set up their Zoom appointments both for when they'll be during office hours and uh, for when they'll be on duty during labs to help with that stuff. You should have received an email to that effect and also talking about some other logistics elements, uh, for instance, that labs will now meet, not exactly virtually, but you'll have a worksheet to do on grade scope and can get help through one of those Zoom meetings uh, if you need it. I also want to apprise you of the fact that I just recently updated the course schedule. Uh, we're still on track to potentially have our second exam and second project due, uh, although well, most of that has been backed off by about a week. Uh, so have a look there. And later on, as I complete the videos, I will plop down links here in the standard lecture materials section uh, that will give you an idea of where to find uh, future YouTube offerings. I think that's all the logistics elements uh, that I have for you now. Uh, so as we move back on to content where we left off prior to spring break uh, was with this business of virtual memory and one of the interesting tools that is in the toolbox of any good programmer these days, which is uh, the memory map function. Uh, to review briefly, uh, memory map allows you to actually manipulate the page tables the operating system has uh, for address translation. And one of the primary uses that we saw for this uh, a moment ago uh, was to take an entire file that normally is stored in RAM for efficiency reasons anyway by the operating system and gain direct access to it. That as you would open a file descriptor, uh, this is in some process table in its file descriptor table, and it points to some internal operating system structures that include the on disk location of the file and any pages that have been copied from the physical storage medium to the more efficient RAM and where those are located. Memory map manipulates the kernel space page table so that you get direct pointers to that. So uh, as I would uh, call mmap and say, give me an address, uh, the operating system might return 4096. And so when I uh, made use of that address to say, show me what's at bytes uh, 4096 in my address space, the kernel is automatically going to translate that to the space associated with, associated with the file uh, as well. Uh, so this allows fairly novel and efficient access to the file structures that the operating system has uh, existing already uh, because it cuts out the middleman. There's no need, uh, as we observed, to take something that's in kernel space, copy it in your program space, make changes to it, and then write it back. You can do everything over here, both in terms of reading and writing. Um, the general drawbacks of using MMAP uh, were to that it only works with the page table and so we'll map in chunks of four kilobytes, uh, 4096 bytes. The whole virtual memory system works on these lines is that addresses aren't translated at an individual mob rates, instead they're translated in these hunks. We alluded to that very early on uh, when we were discussing this uh, bit of business. Uh, this little picture diagram sort of mentions that part that uh, within the page table, you'll see sort of some sort of virtual page number uh, and then the physical page that it occupies the sizes of those are 4k big, uh, but down here, um, the individual addresses then are sequential within it. Within this virtual page uh, ending in uh, 7a000, uh, the virtual addresses that stack up here, uh, they go up to byte 4095, that's the FFF here. They'll be sequential on the same physical page, but as soon as I move to the next page, which appears sequential uh, virtually, uh, it's actually at a distant uh, physical address. Uh, then the whole numbering thing starts over again, starting at that new physical location and bytes in sequence. 
That means that if I have files that are significantly smaller than a page of memory, uh, for instance, just uh, a few hundred bytes, or for instance, if you memory map it, then you occupy uh, some space in the virtual page table uh, that is much smaller than you actually need. So to that end, uh, to fast forward back down here uh, to our discussion of the trade-offs uh, of this, uh, then one of the disadvantages of MMAP is it works at the page uh, level and can then potentially waste space in the pages. Uh, this isn't a ma major concern, but there are times if you're working with hundreds and hundreds of small files uh, that it may become more of a concern. Uh, the other primary concern is that just like everything else you have at the C level, there isn't much bounds checking. There's a minor concern in that uh, memory map, uh, since it manipulates the page table and it's an ask, please change the page table structure so that I have pointers to new things, it won't reflect changing sizes to files. And so if you are shrinking or writing into a file in order to grow it, uh, the memory mapping is static and doesn't reflect that. There are workarounds to this uh, that you can make an additional call to mmap to map new sections of it, but it takes a little bit of finesse. This may be something that we actually poke around with as a bonus problem in project two if I have time to implement that. Uh, but generally, uh, this is something you can work around either by unmapping and remapping or extending the map in various ways. Just take some care. So we're gonna move on uh, to discuss a little bit of the notion of sharing because this is the other place that the page table really allows collaboration between processes to take place. We ended the discussion before spring break with the following picture, which is meant to reflect just a little sort of sort of view of the world uh, where the each process on its own, uh, process A and process B, has this page table that thinks in terms of virtual addresses, uh, it's sequential, and in virtual memory you have stuff that's stacked up uh, that is uh, in sequence. Uh, but the actual page table that the operating system has that maps address zero to address zero, address one to address two instead of address uh, uh, to address one to address five for this one, allows for the operating system to ensure when it's desirable, uh, things that are sequential here are out of sequence in physical memory and the program doesn't see it. Uh, that all of the spaces over here that are distinct from each other and as this process would request more space, you can find it any place in physical memory and map it in there. But most importantly for our purposes for the next few minutes uh, is that certain things can be shared. And you notice this little smiley face down here, uh, virtual page five for both of these processes is mapped to the same physical page uh, seven. Uh, and so the smiley face down here is actually shared between these two processes. To that end, if process A makes a change to it, uh, for instance, changes the uh, closing paren here, which is a smiley, uh, to a opening paren that would be a frowny, uh, then that change would be seen by process B, that it would now think, oh, something has changed for me. Um, this could be a boon if these two processes are collaborating in some way. But it may also be somewhat of a bust if this was unintentional, uh, that process A generally wanted to modify its own stuff without affecting anybody else. By default, all processes uh, don't share anything that would be dangerous to share. And so I want to talk a little bit about stuff that is inherently undangerous uh, to share. Uh, and I think we ended towards uh, the back half of our program discussing what's an obvious choice of something that every program needs, uh, but every program is similarly not gonna change and so can therefore be shared effectively. Uh, to that end, one of the obvious choices are system level libraries, uh, things like printf uh, and uh, malloc and so forth, that just about every program under the sun needs to make use of, but due to the nature of using that code by executing it, they will not change any of the stuff that's associated with those libraries. Um, so to that end, uh, the flexibility that's induced by this page mapping business, that virtual pages for one process and another process can be mapped to distinct spots or in some cases to the same spot. Uh, the first and best use for this is in read-only library code, so that there needs to be on a given system only one spot where the code for printf is present and all of the processes, by virtue of mapping their virtual page to the same physical page where printf is present, uh, can make use of that library. There needs to be only one copy of it rather than one copy for every program. They can all share effectively. 
Uh, there are some other uses uh, for uh, shared memory that we'll talk about in a second, but I want to dwell upon uh, the shared memory uh, business uh, associated with libraries for just a second. We'll backtrack in, in just a sec there. Um, this is a detailed picture of the memory layout of your standard C program that shows a bunch of stuff uh, that is potentially useful. I'm going to focus your attention in the middle a second, and in order to do that, I'm going to pop out of this guy, make him bigger, uh, and then I can actually zoom in here. You'll see that between the stack, which is at a high address, uh, and the heap, which is down here, the malloc arena, and the data and tech stuff, which tends to be at lower addresses, uh, there's a little area that seems a little bit innocuous, uh, but is important uh, because this is usually where the shared libraries uh, like malloc and printf get mapped in. Uh, in general, this stuff is out of bounds to read or modify, so as the stack grows down to it, you automatically get some exceptions from the operating system that you're trying to do something, or map pages that are already mapped, or access memory uh, that is not supposed to be accessed in the way that you are. Uh, and so this uh, acts as a natural boundary and barrier for the stack growth uh, that allows stack overflows to be uh, detected. Uh, so generally, in older systems, the stack and the heap would be adjacent to each other, but in modern Linuxes, at least, uh, it's the case that these, uh, this area in between the stack and the sheep, uh, heap is usually used uh, for shared stuff. And we'll see some examples of that in, in just a second. Uh, there are a bunch of other interesting things down here. Uh, for instance, if you compile things statically, then you might actually get your own copy of malloc and printf and so forth. But if you compile uh, dynamic for dynamic linking, uh, something we won't have a lot of time to sort of get into, then as the program gets loaded, the operating system will pick up and say, oh, I see that you need a malloc. And so we'll use the page table to map some area of memory in here to be the code for malloc, to be the code for printf, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's a whole lot of other things that you can garner from uh, this detailed diagram, including uh, potentially going back to its original source and looking at the additional discussion there. But for more, um, this is a uh, first sign then that there's some things that can easily and naturally be shared, uh, such as these libraries that every uh, function is going to execute but not otherwise change. Uh, so generally then, as multiple processes get started up, uh, there'll be some spot in their memory image that maps onto shared pages for these .so shared object files associated with those shared libraries. Uh, and the .so then, as you'd see it, automatically indicates that uh, libc.so uh, or libpthreads.so, these are shared versions of those libraries meant to be loaded by the operating system into one physical location and then mapped into the space for lots of different processes to use. Um, there's a handy utility associated with this uh, memory mapping business uh, and the page table in general that is worth exploring. Uh, it is called PMAP and takes uh, in its simplest invocation uh, a process ID, uh, 7986 in this little demonstration, uh, to show exactly what the virtual pages that are mapped associated with the running program are. Uh, to demonstrate this, uh, you can garner some from the slide here, but I'm actually going to bring up the code for uh, this memory parts program uh, and then show in a live demo uh, what that looks like in uh, the code editor here. So let me find that. It's in uh, here. I have this uh, memory parts uh, program. Uh, what you'll see in here, this has a fairly simple structure to it in terms of mains. Uh, I have a global array, I have a global variable, I have a local variable to main, I have a malloc array that's down here, uh, and I've gone to the trouble also of opening up uh, and memory mapping a file, this little Gettysburg uh, a bit of business here. And we follow the same structure down here from the memory map we did before, map the entire file in. All this program does is print out as a pointer, that's the percent %p here, what are the addresses for various things. Um, some obvious things like global arrays and local arrays and, and so forth. Uh, the memory address that's the starting point for those arrays, that's what's going to get printed out. Slightly less obvious thing is what does mean to print out main? This will use the C convention that when you print a function, as it were, it's the byte byte address of the first assembly instruction for that function, uh, the address, starting address of that function, as it were. And this will expect to find some place that looks like its code is executable and so forth. 
all that happens after that then is to get the PID of the program, uh, to print it on the screen, and then pause by asking for someone to type a character. Um, uh, this will leave the program live and allow us to run this little PMAP utility on it. So uh, let me fire up a shell here. Uh, let's see, I've got a buzz over to this spot. Uh, let me GCC memory parts. I'm going to run it just as an A dot out. There it is. So I've got the, this thing up. In order for me to use PMAP, I'm going to need a second shell. So let me uh, fire that up over here on the left hand side. Uh, this virtual memory code. Uh, it looks like the PID over here is 76971. Uh, so I'll PMAP that. Uh, and this will show uh, the virtual pages that have been mapped uh, for this running program, e dot out. Uh, let's see, over here, uh, you'll see some things that we alluded to, that certainly the program code for this in uh, both its data form and its a dot uh, out executable form, uh, those have to be present. And it's interesting to draw a few correlations. Uh, for instance, here's the address of main. Uh, starts with uh, something like 564C8AEB. Uh, here is uh, that virtual disk, 564C8AEB, uh, and then 200, let's see, this would be, uh, let's see, 21D, so ending in the 2 right here. And you might suspect right off the bat that, oh, this is a good spot for main to be because that memory is marked as executable. Uh, as I can read the instructions there and I can feed them to the processor to commit actions. These permissions, like R and X, they reflect just what the file permissions are too, that the data in memory at this point uh, is readable and executable. Uh, there's some other stuff here that's read only. Uh, and for instance, there's a read write section of the A dot out as well. Uh, that ends in AEB500 and so forth. And if you look over here, you'll see uh, a good candidate for that. Uh, Let's see, 500 AEB 500. Uh, that's close to where the global array is at. So it makes perfect sense that I wouldn't want to execute the stuff there. It's an array of data, but I would potentially want to write new values to it over there. Uh, there's some anomalous stuff, it's hard to say, but here is libc, uh, where the address for printf and so forth would be present. Uh, in fact, it might actually be sort of interesting uh, to check on that a uh, quick. Uh, let me come back and make a quick a change to this. Uh, we are going to print out the address of printf uh, in this case as well, is printf, and see if this uh, gets me into one of those uh, shared C libraries. Just got to recompile here quick. Uh, let's see here, DC memory parts, uh, I'll rerun it. Uh, you'll see the ad address for printf is a s a somewhat different from where main is located. Uh, and let me pull up that other terminal then here. And I'll need to PMAP now 76902. I'll PMAP that. Uh, you can see the executable part of this uh, libc bit of business. Uh, it's at 7f uh, ba 5 e so forth. Uh, that's uh, 7fb1. Uh, this is pretty close then uh, to where the code uh, for printf ought to be. Uh, you just expect that uh, being that this libc business uh, is likely to contain printf and has uh, similar addresses in that part. It's readable and executable, which is a sign that it's probably uh, printf stuff. You know that printf has some global buffers associated with it, which is probably this read-write section of the libc. Uh, that's probably not shared, uh, is in that uh, most instances that use printf will need their own set of buffers so that they don't interfere with anything else. Uh, and various other things, for instance, the address of Gettysburg is here. Uh, that's reflected uh, in the mmap file, 7fb1a. There's a 7f1b1a. Um, that's uh, associated with where it's at. It's marked as read only because when I requested the memory map, uh, that's uh, marked as that. A local variable, uh, like a local r here, 7fff, uh, that's up here in the stack, 7fff. Uh, that's definitely a good candidate for where uh, the... Uh, stuff is that. And finally, that uh, malloc array, uh, 55F9. Let's see, 55F9 here. There's some anonymous space that's been uh, mapped as read write. And I think this one will probably be in that later 936, 936. Yeah, so uh, it's here. This is the heap, uh, more or less. Uh, and you can see in between the stack up here uh, at high address. Uh, and the lowest sort of stuff, the stuff that is associated with this code's uh, 
executable and data sections uh, in between that is this um, set of shared memory stuff uh, that's been mapped uh, using mmap or its equivalent. So uh, this is a handy utility uh, to demonstrate uh, part of the page table, at least the virtual addresses are things. I've never figured out a way to get PMAP. I don't think it's possible to do so with PMAP uh, to show what the physical addresses for those things are. It's not likely that this is easy because it's probably a security risk to reveal the actual physical RAM address uh, where some of these things are stored. Uh, if you ever uh, find a way to do that, I'd be curious to know uh, what it is. Uh, please do share. There'll be some uh, uh, some credit in the form of bonus cards or uh, engagement points uh, on that front. So there's some additional details we could go to into on what uh, PMAP provides to you, but you see sizes, permissions, virtual addresses, and then what, the, to the best of the ability of the operating system, uh, what it can determine the process is using this kind of stuff for. Uh, on that front then, uh, it's apparent from these PMAP bits uh, that the operating system actually marks these pages in the page table using permissions that are associated with files as well. As in, you can mark a page of memory as readable and executable. Uh, that's often associated with code. Uh, stuff that's read only is obviously going to trigger some sort of a fault in the operating system if you try to write or execute it. Stuff that's read write is generally associated with data. Uh, and there's also a bit that's uh, associated with sharing. Uh, and if you back up uh, to the demonstration we had over here, uh, I guess I don't have anything that looks like that right now, but maybe back here, yeah, in the one version of this at least I chose to share the memory that's associated with Gettysburg. Uh, this is that memory map file, and so any changes I would make would be uh, written back to the file system and seen by other processes. Uh, so to that end, uh, it's a useful tool for sharing on that front. Um, to that end, I want to back up just a few slides uh, to talk about something we'll deal with in more detail later. But generally, the modern way to arrange for any sort of shared memory is through the page table. Uh, this will come under the heading of interprocess communication, a direction that we're going to move in very soon as we've been discussing signals that programs can send uh, from one to the other, and communication buffers and synchronization mechanisms uh, that programs do use to, to cooperate. Uh, but this is a, a foretaste of that stuff, uh, that the general modern systems of the POSIX nature uh, make use of MMAP along with forking or MMAPing uh, by several processes uh, to the same set of memory in order to create a space that they share, that as process one would write into it, process two uh, would see it. This is not the default, and so some of the code that's on here is meant to illustrate the setups in order to get this. Generally, if you, for instance, malloc some space and then fork off a child process, both the parent and the child process uh, can manipulate that malloc memory independent of one another. Uh, but by making use of these shared memory facilities, you can see uh, some calls here that we'll discuss later to get an anonymous file descriptor associated with some sort of block of memory to set the size of that uh, file, uh, and F truncate is used for that, uh, both for files and for uh, blocks of main memory along these lines, and then an invocation as expected of memory map. Please change the page table so that this pointer that's returned points to these bytes that are going to be shareable. After a fork at this point, both a child and a parent will be able to make changes to this block of shared bytes, and they'll both be coordinated and see those changes with each other. We'll discuss that in some more detail later on uh, as we begin discussing how multiple processes uh, can cooperate on stuff. But uh, by default, that is not the case. You can see there's some work involved in, in um, getting it up and running. Um, so the final thing uh, that we need to talk about is the relation of the page table uh, to this act of forking. Uh, generally, forking is this thing that we've realized will create a copy of a process. Uh, and it's the case that if you have two processes, uh, one naive way of going about doing this uh, is that one process one forks off child process two the copy of it, uh, process to the child in this case, um, it will point to the same physical areas of memory that the parent does. Now this is potentially dangerous because you have two processes then 
in potentially an uncoordinated way, uh, uh, sort of hammering on the same sets of memory. So that as the parent process changes the variable, the child process uh, will see that change in the variable and it can affect how the child process behaves. All of you, based on what you've observed so far, know that this doesn't happen. And so uh, this danger is avoided, but it's a curious sort of facet of efficient operating system development to determine exactly how it, uh, it happens uh, and in what way uh, you can affect this in an efficient uh, manner. One obvious solution is rather than the picture that you see here, when process one forks off process two, it will make uh, a request, make a copy of page A someplace else, uh, call it page A2. Make a copy of page B, uh, call it page B2. Make a copy of page C, call it page C2. And then uh, as part of the fork underlying mechanism, the memory map for the new process is adjusted to point at those new pages instead. This should induce an obvious sort of cringe moment of every time you fork a process, then I am copying the entire memory image of the parent process. Uh, this is gonna be inefficient, both because I have to copy a lot of memory and because it's very likely that for lots of fork processes, they're immediately going to call exec to adopt a new process image entirely. So you're getting sort of a double whammy. Uh, just a fork, you make a bunch of copies, and uh, then when process two executes this exec command, all of the stuff that you copied is sort of moot anyway because it's gonna be overwritten by a new set of code to write, uh, a new heap well, that's gonna make use of, and so forth. Um, so to avoid this particular inefficiency, uh, it's the case that m most operating systems uh, have a hybrid approach to it. Um, so as process one forks off process two, the page table is essentially inherited for process two. So we'll point to all the same stuff that the process uh, parent process does as well. But each of these pages are marked specially in that manner. They're marked as so-called so copy on write, uh, or cow for short, uh, thus the little uh, moo cow uh, down here. Uh, now the effect of this is that if page A contains the executable code for process one, Process two has a copy of that via its page table pointing to it. But because this code is read and execute only, process two is never gonna change that. We've effectively saved ourselves a page because these two can in fact share that page uh, without any interfering with each other. If page B has a bunch of constants in it, for instance, the format strings associated with printfs uh, from the program, uh, they're marked as read only, then this page is never gonna get written by either of these processes. And again, we're saving memory because they're going to uh, be able to share it effectively. Uh, so finally then, uh, page C, which maybe has some global read write data in it, is something that is also marked as copy on write. Uh, if the parent process come along, gets to go first and says, uh, now that I forked off this child, I'm gonna write a new value uh, to this page C down here. This will trigger a fault in the operating system due to this page C being marked as copy on write. The operating system will say, oh crap, okay, uh, both of you are pointing at this page C, uh, but one of you is writing to it and therefore needs its own personal copy. I'm gonna copy the entirety of page C down here, redirect the process that triggered the fault to point at that page instead, uh, and then mark this thing now as you, you, this other process can do whatever it wants with it. Uh, to that end then, uh, process one resumes thinking, oh, I have this copy of page C, I can make writes to it, and it's independent from process two. This explains one of the mysteries uh, that's associated with the fork system calls, like why is it that the only way to initiate a new process uh, is to fork off the current process. Uh, the, it's the case then that you're in complete control over the code that's associated with that new process. You can do things like IO redirection. And also, if you continue to make use of that process, it automatically shares as much as possible with the parent process. And we'll share it for as long as possible by virtue of marking those, those parties being marked as copy on write. To that end, uh, fork is sort of a sneaky way then of allowing for as much sharing and efficiency and flexibility as possible. That's facilitated through this page table mechanism. 
Uh, and it should be said that the fork mechanism somewhat predates the modern virtual memory system. Uh, it was the case that in the old days, fork was considered a heavyweight uh, process initiation, uh, and that it really would copy all the pages uh, for a second process, and you really would then get clobbered a second time uh, for performance if you were execing. Thus birthed this whole branch that we'll study later of creating threads, as in a second thread of execution within process one that shares all the same stuff with it, uh, but otherwise uh, is uh, independent in terms of code that's going to execute. These days, forking on modern Linuxes and most Unices is very efficient. Uh, and if, even if you have a process with a very large memory image, uh, such as you'd see in big sort of parallel computations, uh, then it's possible to fork still very efficiently because uh, as much as possible is shared with the parent process. Uh, to that end, I've actually personally benefited from this because uh, I've made use of libraries and, for instance, the R statistics or Python library to work on big data. Uh, R and Python are notoriously bad because they don't have much of a threading capability. They tend to parallelize by spinning up new processes. But unlike this proves to be fairly efficient because uh, the, all of the data that they use, so long as you're not writing to it, uh, ends up being um, read-only and therefore uh, efficiently shared between parent and child processes. Uh, so we'll talk more about threads and differences between it, uh, but then the traditional Unix mechanism of forking and sharing as little as possible from the perspective of the process, but as much as possible for, from the perspective of the uh, operating system. This is facilitated by the virtual memory system, the page tables, and this ability to mark pages as copy on write. That's a wrap in terms of our virtual memory discussion. Uh, as a summary, uh, and I should probably fix this Tysco uh, a consequence, uh, sounds sort of French in that. Or uh, but there are a number of advantages uh, and consequences of making use of this virtual memory system that are listed here. Uh, that all programs are greatly simplified in terms of their internals because they all see this linear uh, address space that byte 124 or 1024 is uh, immediately before 1025, immediately before 1026, and so forth. Uh, and in terms of the process themselves, they just think they own the entirety of memory. Uh, the OS is, then has this responsibility of maintaining the page table, but that actually creates a whole lot of um, flexibility on the part of the operating system because it can remap things to various spots in physical memory as programs make requests for more memory. Uh, so computers with small amounts of RAM can fake larger amounts by backing up with disk space, uh, and RAM can then serve as a cache so that if lots of processes need lots of memory, you can't don't necessarily have to say no, things just slow down as you start swapping things in and out of disk space. There is a small performance hit uh, for doing this translation uh, because every address reference has to be translated by the OS, but the hardware that manages this uh, we talked about this earlier, uh, the MMU memory management units and its cache, the translation look aside buffer, TLB, they generally make this uh, fairly um, inexpensive uh, in practical settings. Uh, and certainly these other benefits outweigh them considerably. Uh, finally then, memory can be shared efficiently between things. Uh, for instance, by having a program that's forking off a child, share as much between child and parent as possible. Having the operating system share if its internal RAM buffers for files with the program directly through MMAP uh, and various other mechanisms that are out there. I'm going to close us for now, uh, and very soon I'll try to put together another video uh, which begins our discussion of signals, uh, which is where we'll start to encounter programs and processes interacting with each other, uh, and most importantly, they'll be interacting with each other in an unpredictable order. Uh, this issue of synchronous and asynchronous access is going to come to the fore, and it's going to give everyone headaches. Uh, but for the moment, uh, the virtual memory system is at a close. I'll see you guys next time.